I just want to say to the worship team, thanks for making me follow that. <laughs> that was so good, so good, bringing us uh, into this place. And man, and man, here's here's the thing. There's uh, oh, just heads up, we're going long today. Okay, um, so. Uh, like musically, they're freaking brilliant, right? Uh, but to to they're worshipers. Like that's the biggest part about who they are. When I see our our worship director, who's behind the scenes, back there behind the keys, he's not even playing. He's facing the other way, just worshiping. Um, man, that's that's why you have that. Not because they're skilled musicians, but because they worship Jesus. Um, so yeah. Um, now I, I know what you're uh, probably thinking as you as you look at me. You're probably thinking he's a baller. Uh, you're probably like he, like that guy in the sweater is a shot caller. Like um, like that guy knows how to ball. Maybe <laughs> you shush. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> But many years ago, uh, after I graduated from uh, college, I moved back to my hometown of Elyria, Ohio. Uh, wh what the? Really? You, Elyria, Ohio? That is the most random thing ever. Let's talk later and we can commiserate together. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that was, yeah, the whole town is right here in this room. Uh, so <laughs> Anyway, move, we're going long. Uh, moved back to Elyria, and uh, I wanted to develop some community, find some community in my home church, uh, you know, make some friends. Um, and we had a pretty well-developed intramural sports program in my church. And I played some sports in high school, so I felt like that was a natural fit for me to, to find that sense of community to make some friends. And by and large, that's, that's exactly what happened. Um, I jumped in, we played basketball, I, I found community, I made friends with guys who were older than me, I made friends with guys who were uh, younger than me, uh, I got to intermingle with other circles because like, I, I, didn't, I didn't have a circle uh, because I hadn't been in that church since uh, before I started college, uh, six years before don't judge me. I heard you laughing at that. Anyway, uh, sometimes it takes some of us longer to get through college. Is that okay? Anyway, um, and, so, and so I found that, and it was just a joy for me every week. It was a highlight of every week to go to the gym, to get my workout on, to get a good sweat on, and then after the game, give high fives and hugs to the, to the opposing team. It was exactly what I was looking for. Uh, there was one instance However, when that sense of community, that sense of friendship got, um, let's just say, assaulted, okay, uh, because we were playing a team um, whose captain was the person that I looked up to more uh, than anyone else in my, uh, in my high school career. Um, we'll, uh, we'll just call him Brian, because uh, that's what his name was. And um, when he... he <laughs> Hey, Brian. Uh, he was a senior when I was a freshman. He played soccer. I played soccer. I wanted to play soccer uh, like him. I wanted to be Brian. And uh, he, I just thought he was the coolest person alive, so I wanted to be like him. During soccer training in the summertime, I couldn't get a ride to soccer training. My mom couldn't swing it between work and everything. And so he picked me up and gave me rides to and from soccer training. He was basically, in my mind, the coolest person who ever lived. And so I was pretty excited to play uh, Brian's team. And things were going along fine. It was a competitive game. The lead was uh, going back and forth and whatnot. And uh, it, was, it was a really good competitive game. And then partway through the game, I was guarding Brian at the time. And I don't know if he felt like I was guarding him too closely or that I was bumping him or fouling him and the refs weren't calling uh, the fouls. But uh, he, made a, he made a cut past me. And when he got past me, he reached around behind himself and grabbed me by the face, face, and threw me to the court. I'm like, what the honks just happened? 
Like, I am the nicest person alive. Why would you do that to me? And so I was just like totally stunned. And so I went to the free throw line. The ref called the foul. I go to the free throw line, getting ready to take my free throws. And Brian is lined up on the key right here. And so I reach out to him. I'm like, hey, man, no hard feelings. And he pushed my hand away and turned away. Okay, so I, I, you know, I, I took my free throws, made them, of course, because I'm me. And, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and immediately upon making the second one, I turned to my captain, Mark. I was like, Mark, take me out of the game. He's like, why? I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to lose a friendship over a basketball game. I need to get out of the game. And so I pulled myself out of the game. Uh, far too often, our experience with this thing called church looks too much like that. We, we come to it expecting it to be enriching, expecting to find community, expecting to grow, expecting to find some direction for our lives. But sometimes, sometimes after we get in here, the truth of what happens is that someone figuratively grabs us by the face and throws us to the court. And we're left stunned and we just want to tap out of the game or we fight through it bitter and wanting revenge. Like if the opportunity presented itself for us to figuratively grab them by the face and throw them to the court, we would do that. Or maybe literally, I don't know. I have a feeling that Paul, based on the passage that you read earlier this morning, saw the potential for this happening, and he felt the need to address it. Uh, Well, my name is uh, Fitz. I'm one of the pastors here, in case we haven't met. And you read the scripture passage, uh, you heard the scripture passage read to you earlier, so we're just going to dive in. So Paul is writing this letter to a group of uh, believers in a town called Philippi. That's why it's called uh, the book of Philippians. And after writing a brief introduction to the letter, he jumps right in. And he starts by saying, most important... Most important, like this is the most important thing that I want you to get out of this. Uh, I used to coach my oldest son, Colin. He's in college now. I used to coach him in uh, soccer. And um, when I coached this team of young elementary school boys, I gave them each practice and every game the ABCs of what I expected out of them. Act like Jesus, uh, be a learner, choose to have fun, and do your best. So it should have been the ABCDs, whatever, it's fine. Uh, grammar is hard. Anyway, uh, so I, every practice, every game, I would instill that in their minds. Did you act like Jesus? Did you, did, you, did you learn something? Did you have fun? Did you do your best? Yes. All right, we had a good game, but coach, we lost eight nothing. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. If you did those four, it was not like a competitive travel team or anything like that. It was a church league team. I'm like, so if you did these four things, we had a good game. It was my most important speech. Here's Paul's most important statement. Most important, live together in a manner worthy of Christ's gospel. Let that just soak into your spirit. Most important, live together in a manner worthy of Christ's gospel. The word worthy that Paul uses here can best be understood. Uh, It's a Greek word uh, called axios, Greek word axios. And it can best be understood if you picture one of those old-timey scales. You know, like the one on the screen there. So you've got the two things on either side. You're trying to weigh something on the one side. So you put weights on the other side to figure out how much it weighs by getting them to balance. So the two sides, the goal is that the two sides balance each other out. And so Paul on one side, puts the gospel of Jesus Christ. And on the other side, he puts your conduct. So how we live, how we conduct our lives should balance out with the full weight of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's consider that for just a minute. First, we have a holy, righteous, perfect God. And this God, out of love, decides to start creating and and, and creates humans. 
And this God wants these humans to choose to love him, so he gives them the, the opportunity to choose between right and wrong, the ability to choose between right and wrong. And pretty much out of the gate, they choose wrong. And they continue that for thousands of years of existence, con collectively and individually shaking their fist at God in rebellion. No, we will not choose to love you. And this holy God, not content with the separation that exists between him and his creation, offers up his one and only son, his sinless son on the altar to be sacrificed on their behalf, thereby buying their redemption and thereby buying the opportunity for that gap to be bridged. And he did all of that while we, according to Paul in the letter to Romans, we're still sinners. We're yet sinners while we were still collectively and individually shaking our angry, rebellious fist at God. He did that anyway. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the greatest story in history of holiness and love and sacrifice in the history of anything. And Paul is saying, live in a manner that is worthy of that. Let that sink in. That is a huge ask. Now, when we consider the, the, the concept of holiness, we can tend to, as humans, bring one of two attitudes to the table. Some of us feel naturally worthy. I, I deserve the good that comes my way. I'm a, I'm a good guy. I'm likable. I haven't killed anyone in a while, and I haven't done or ever. Um, I haven't done really bad things, so I deserve any good that, that comes my way. Others of us feel naturally unworthy. I don't like me, and nobody else does either. I, I know the bad things I've done. Other people do too, so God must know them, so I'm just, I'm not worthy. I am worth less. And while prevalent, I don't know that either of these attitudes are very helpful or healthy ways to view the worth and value of an individual. While it's true that we have inestimable value and worth, it's not because of anything we've done or how likable we are. It's about the fact that God chose to create us and then God chose to redeem us. It's God that gives us an enormous sense of worth. And while it's true that we marred our worth by our choices to walk away from God and to, to shake that angry, rebellious fist at him, he continued and continues to love us like a good, good father. Like the father in the story of the prodigal son, he's waiting for us to turn around so he can run down the driveway, wrap us up in his arms, and plant kisses all over our face. And that's what we call in church circles grace. Grace. It's the idea that anything good that comes to our lives does so not because we deserve it, but because that there is a loving God who loves us so much that he chose to bless us with his love and his grace and his forgiveness and his mercy. Now, when we come to grips with this concept, with this idea of grace, with the idea of how little we deserve it, it hurts my brain to think about living life in a manner that is worthy of that. That's a lot to ask. How in the world do we do that? What does that even look like? Paul has some thoughts, and he spells them out in some of the phrases that he uses in, in this section of the letter. In, in, in verse 27 of chapter 1, he says, live together. Also in that verse, he says, united in one spirit and mind. Chapter 2, verse 2, he says, thinking the same way. He says, having the same love. Being united. Agreeing with each other. The key idea to living life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, according to Paul and what we read here, is living in unity. Living a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ looks like living in unity. 
Now, this is a countercultural thought because whole cultures, including ours, are built on winning and, and, and conquest and competition and, and conflict, not living in unity. Uh, nowhere is this more evident than in politics, although we didn't really see it this political cycle, right? It was really civil. Everyone was really nice. Uh, <laughs> politics has migrated from a debate on issues and, and policies and thoughts to a slow-motion train wreck of conflict and competition that none of us can tear our attention away from. Jabs and, and, and insults and tearing down all in an effort to win, all in an effort to conquer. You see it in social media. You know, I can... I can Get on social media and I can post something on your Facebook. I can post something on your Twitter or X feed or threads or whatever else is out there without worrying about consequence because it's sort of anonymous, right? I can say what I want to say on social media and hit send because I want to make sure that you know that I'm right. I want to make sure that you know that I got the last word. Oh, you posted again? Let me answer you real quick. It's all about winning. It's all about competition. And we'll do that because it feels different than standing face to face with someone. I mean, we even fall prey to this in the church world, a little insider, insider conversation about how some uh, pastors uh, think, none, none here. Um, but uh, man, there's this desire to have our worship services and our offerings to be so good that people will want to come here instead of going there wherever the there is. And while it's fine to strive for excellence, I think God wants us to bring our, our best to the table. If we're doing it out of a sense of us versus them, there's a problem there. And in the church world, we come by it honestly because Adam and Eve, they ate from the tree because they wanted to, to be like God. They wanted to compete with God. Uh, those who built the Tower of Babel, they wanted to get up to God so they could compete with God. The 12 tribes of Israel were torn apart out of competition and conflict. Uh, Paul and Barnabas couldn't decide what to do with John Mark, so they went their separate ways. This conflict in the church has a long, long history. Uh, but you know where I see this most prevalently? Right here. Right in my head. I don't know if any of you watched the, uh, the Tyson-Jake Paul fight the other night. Uh, it wasn't much of a fight, <laughs> weren't many punches thrown, but, uh, back in the day, Mike Tyson was one of the most fiercest, one of the most fiercest grammar's hard, uh, <laughs> boxers ever. Um, his uppercut, his left uppercut was just deadly, but the punches he throws, uh, they can't hold a candle to the, the jabs that I have in my head. I'm just waiting for a conversation. All the time I'm rehearsing conversations in my head. Oh, if she says this to me, if he says this to me, oh, here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to get him. Mike Tyson doesn't hold a candle to me. And all I'm doing is building up barriers instead of striving for unity. And so what would it look like if we, instead of seeking to win all the time, if we as followers of Jesus sought to find common ground. Uh, uh, Jesus was the most countercultural person who ever lived, right? He never looked for divisors. When he called people, he never asked them if they were good enough. He never asked them if they were the best of the best. He, 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 he never said, hey, I need to win, so are you going to help me win? Are you the best one out there? We need to do this thing. No, actually, he called the not good enoughs. He said, you're not good enough? You're good enough for me. Come, follow me. And you couldn't have had a more diverse group of individuals. On one side, you had tax collectors who were working for Rome to rob from the fellow, their fellow Jews. On the other side, you had zealots who, who advocated for a violent overthrow of Rome. They were in the same group. And then in here, you got fishermen who nobody thought was worth anything. But we, on the other hand, we, we tend to seek conformity with everyone we hang out with. Do you believe like I believe? Do you see everything through the same lens that I do? If not, you should go over there. My people will be over here. That's how we do it. 
Well, later in this letter, Paul uh, paints a distinction between being a citizen of earth and a citizen of heaven. And the word we get uh, conduct or manner of life is the same word that we get politics or politician from. It's a Greek word, politiuma, meaning your conduct as a citizen. And so readers or listeners of this letter would have understood that their citizenship belonged to Rome. So even though Rome was thousands of miles away, their citizenship still belonged there. But Paul reframed their idea of citizenship. Uh, Instead of only being citizens of Rome, he wanted them to understand that they were also, and probably more importantly, citizens of heaven. And so while the world says compete and fight and win, especially when thinking about relating to a superpower, Paul says to the Philippians, you are citizens of heaven. And that citizenship should take precedence in how you conduct yourselves. And as such, as citizens of heaven, you need to seek unity. Citizens of heaven, you seek unity. And I believe that Paul is saying to you and to me today, as citizens of that same heaven, we need to seek unity. I wonder, if, uh, I wonder if people who are not um, involved in church, who wouldn't consider them to be uh, Jesus followers, m- might get turned off to the church, the big C church, not just this church, but the church in general, by the way we don't do this very well. We seem to be really good at identifying the things that we are against, about the things that we don't share in common, and not real good about striving for unity. We, we struggle and fight for so many things that in the grand scheme of things don't really matter all that much. And, and the world looks at us and thinks, if they can't get along, if they can't treat each other any better than that, man, why do I want to be a part of that? I don't, I don't need that in my life. But everyone wants to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Everyone wants to be on a team of people that are striving towards the same goal and fighting for that goal instead of fighting against each other. And when we strive for unity, when we look for common ground, we paint a picture, a beautiful picture of something that people will want to be a part of. But to be clear, what I'm not saying is um, whatever you want to believe is okay. I think that that orthodox belief is important, believing in God, the Father, and Jesus, Holy Spirit, Bible, all those things, I think that is vital. But Jesus never said, they'll know you're my disciples if you have the best arguments that beat theirs. He says, they're going to know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. And one way that we can show that love is by striving for unity, looking for common ground. So how do, how do we do that? Well, uh, the key to living in unity is found in verses 3 and 4 where Paul writes, Don't do anything for selfish purposes, but with humility think of others as better than yourselves. Instead of each person watching out for their own good, watch out for what is better for others. Looking out for number one, should never be priority number one. Looking out for number one should never be priority number one. Instead, he says, think of others as better than yourselves. In my years doing student ministry, I would often tell my volunteers, when you see a kid, whatever kid it is in the ministry, treat them like they're the most important kid in the room. And and what if we took that a step further and just said, every person you encounter, don't just treat them. Don't just treat them like they're the most important person in the world. What if you actually viewed them like they were the most important person in the world? The person you encounter when you walk into church, when you, when you go through the checkout line at Kroger, at the oil chain station, wherever you go, what if you encounter each person and view them as if they were the most important person in the world and treated them that way? That would change lives, that would change communities, that would change this country, that would change this world if we just did that one thing. And he says, Paul says this comes from a center of humility. Uh, My son Colin, in college now, uh, when he was younger, uh, at bedtime is when he would ask all the big questions. Uh, I don't know if it was a stalling tactic. I don't think for him it was. I would think like, oh, I'm laying down. Now my brain's going to start working. And he would ask the big questions. He asked me one night, dad, if we're supposed to be humble, 
Why does God say we're supposed to worship him? It doesn't sound very humble of God to go, be humble, but me, worship me, right? But I told him that humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's having an accurate view of yourself. And an accurate view of me is that I'm no better than any of you. And the accurate view of you is you're no better than anyone else. We're all on level ground. C.S. Lewis puts it this way, true humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. And Paul draws a distinction between humility and having selfish purposes. So go back to the conversation about living a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If Jesus had been operating out of a sense of selfish purposes, I don't think he would have, and this is just a guess, I don't think he would have gone to the cross because that sounds terrible. I think he would have, as he says that he could have, called thousands of angels to come and to rescue him, but he wasn't looking out of his own interest, was he? He was looking out of ours. He was considering others, you and me, as better than himself. He was considering our best interest ahead of his own. And we say we're Christians. We say we follow Christ. That's our model. That's our calling card. That's living life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're left with two pictures. One is of us metaphorically grabbing each other by the face and throwing each other to the court because we want our way. We want what we want. We want to win. The other is of a God who laid laid aside all of his privileges, all of his rights, laid, laid aside his selfish desires so that he could, in our best interests, be reunited with us. This picture is what unity looks like. This picture is what humble looks like. This picture is what looking out for the interests of others looks like. And this is what it looks like to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And friends, this is what God is saying to you and me to go and do. Would you pray with me? God, this is not an easy word. Uh, You did not set a low bar (laughs) to live a life worthy of your gospel, to live a life worthy of the greatest story of love and sacrifice ever. We're supposed to do that. But that's what you've called us to. But thank you that you didn't say you got to do this on your own, but that you give us your Holy Spirit to make up for our faults, our falling short. And so God, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can operate out of that fullness. And as we go forth from this place, can live a life worthy of your gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have been blessed by this video, feel free to comment on what spoke to you. Hit the like button and share this with a friend who needs encouragement today. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you won't miss out on any of the latest videos. Thank you for watching and we'll see you soon.